Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neuronal Dynamics of Cognition. We have looked at different models of synaptic plasticity and we have discussed happy and learning, we have discussed SDDP. Now, SDDP is often summarized in terms of the pair-based plasticity window, the characteristic SDDP function. However, this SDDP function is only part of the story and therefore the pair-based plasticity models that we have discussed so far are not sufficient. However, as we will see, the mathematical tools of synaptic traces that we have developed for the pair-based plasticity models can also be used in a more general setting. So for standard SDP experiments, we use pairs of pre- and post-synaptic spikes, which come with a certain time difference, for example, 10 milliseconds, and which are repeated after a repetition time big T. And then if you do 60 or 70 or 80, or maybe 200 of these repetitions pre-post, 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 you get a certain result. And if the timing was 10 milliseconds, and if the repetitions are done at 20 hertz, which means every 50 milliseconds, then you get a LTP result, which is characterized at this point. So weights that had previously a normalized weight of 100 now have a weight of roughly 130. But this result has an additional parameter, and that's the repetition period or the repetition frequency. So 1 over t is this frequency rho. Now, instead of repeating at 50 milliseconds, which means 20 hertz, we may, for example, want to repeat at a very long time interval, say 0.1 hertz. That's this point here. That means the next repetition would be 10 seconds later. So in a standard pair-based plasticity model, I could say, well, this is a pair. I have a postsynaptic spike here. I have a presynaptic spike coming before. So it doesn't matter whether I repeat this at a frequency of 20 hertz or 1 hertz or 0.1 hertz. As long as I have 60 pairs, it should always give the same result. However, that's not the case. You see that if I repeat at 0.1 hertz, the same spike pairs with a difference of 10 milliseconds have no effect at all. Now the curve for LTD, so if I have a situation where I repeat post before pre, post before pre, post before pre, at very low frequencies give a result, and then it bends over. And of course, if I am stimulating at a repetition frequency of 50 hertz, then the whole thing becomes symmetric because I have a post, I have pre, post, and then I have another pre here, and I have another pre here, and I have other posts sitting here and there. So I will have as many pre-post pairs as post-pre pairs. And it doesn't matter anymore, except for the very first spike. It doesn't matter whether I do 60 repetitions pre-post, 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 or the other way around. Now, a standard pair-based plasticity model of the form that we have discussed so far cannot account for these frequency effects. In particular, there is this problem that we don't see any plasticity at very low frequency. So the question now is, can we account for this frequency dependence of SDDP? And here is how we do this. We use the trick of synaptic traces. So as before, we say a presynaptic spike leaves a trace. Now what matters is the value of this trace at the moment when a postsynaptic spike occurs. So I would read out this value as before. However, that is not sufficient. 
I assume that there has been an earlier postsynaptic spike, which also leaves a trace. And then what matters is the value of this trace just before the next postsynaptic spike. So the weight change happens at the moment of the postsynaptic spike. It happens here. And it's proportional to this slow trace that we have here and proportional to this fast presynaptic trace that we have here. When I say presynaptic trace, I mean the trace left by the presynaptic spike at the location of the synapse. So now this means LTP, spike timing dependent LTP, is not induced by a pair of spikes pre-post but by a triplet of spikes, post, pre, post. And therefore, we have this triplet effect. Now, for the LTD part, we keep the same rule as before. A postsynaptic spike leaves yet another trace, and the presynaptic spike reads out the value of this trace and it gives a weight change with a negative parameter. So with this model, one can account for this effect that there is no plasticity at very low frequencies. And this is a very common phenomenon that has been found in several experiments, and that's also found in many other plasticity models. So these traces are a mathematical tool, and we can ask what's the biological meaning. For example, this trace left by a postsynaptic spike could correspond to the elevated voltage or to an elevated calcium or to the elevated second messenger somewhere in the membrane close to the synapse. This trace could be the glutamate bound to the postsynaptic receptor. This trace could again be something like calcium. The advantage of this abstract modeling at the level of traces is that we don't have to specify which molecule is involved. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, there are probably hundreds of different molecules involved in synaptic plasticity. Now with this model, it gets more complicated. However, we can try to do again the transition to rate models. So, suppose I have presynaptic spikes coming with a Poisson spike arrival rate and the postsynaptic spikes come with a Poisson rate, and I say these two are independent, just to keep things simple, then this will create a contribution, minus B, nu I post, times nu J pre, where this is the presynaptic rate and the postsynaptic rate. I need two spikes. If I increase the rate, the probability that the two spikes are close to each other will increase with the presynaptic rate and with the postsynaptic rate. Now, in addition, I have a contribution from the triplet term. And again, if I assume that these spikes are Poisson generated, these spikes are Poisson generated, I need three spikes. I need this spike close to this one and this spike close to this one. And the likelihood that I will find such a triplet will depend on the postsynaptic rate squared. I want those two spikes close to each other and will be proportional to the presynaptic fine rate. And there will be a constant, a plus, and it will have a positive sign. Now the exact value will also depend on the width of these traces, so there will be proportional, proportionality constants alpha and beta in front. What's interesting here is that this term is very similar to the terms we have seen for the BCM model. This term is also similar to the term we have seen in the BCM model. The parameters of the triplet model can be extracted from experiments and this transition from spikes to rates allows us to fix the parameters of the BCM model. So the triplet model is a very nice model. It's mathematically simple. And 
we can extract parameters of the model directly from the experiment. If you make the assumption that the input spike train and the postsynaptic spike train are both independent Poisson processes, then we can find an equivalence to the BCM model, which we can use to fix parameters of the BCM model. Now, the triplet model accounts for the frequency effects that a pair-based plasticity model cannot account for. So, pair-based plasticity models, the standard plasticity figures with the SDP window, are not sufficient to account for experimental data. And these kind of triplet models is what we are going to use in the following.